So first, uh, I'm going to introduce you. So, oh, let me see. Uh, I'm going to introduce you in Spanish, okay? Absolutely, Veronica. Okay. Yeah. Um, eh, buenas tardes, vamos a dar inicio a la conferencia del Dr. Casaunet. Eh, Paddy Casaunet es un profesor asociado y jefe del Departamento de Ciencias Farmacéuticas en la Facultad de Farmacología de la Universidad de Texas A&M. El doctor Casaune se desempeñó recientemente como presidente fundador del Departamento de Ciencias Farmacéuticas de la Facultad de Farmacia de, Farmacia de la Universidad de Texas en Paso. También él ha sido miembro de la Faculty del Departamento de Ciencias Farmacéuticas de la Western University of Health Sciences en Los Ángeles, California. El doctor Casaune recibió su licenciatura en farmacia en la Universidad de Ciencia y Tecnología de Jordania y un PhD en farmacología de la Universidad de Illinois en Chicago. La línea investigativa del doctor Casaune se centra en el estudio de la trombosis y la biología plaquetaria. El objetivo principal es delinear las vías de señalización involucradas en la activación plaquetaria e investigar su papel en la patogénesis de las enfermedades trombóticas. Para cumplir sus objetivos, el doctor Casado y su equipo emplean una serie de enfoques moleculares, bioquímicos y farmacológicos, así como modelos de trombosis en sus estudios. Su objetivo Final es identificar nuevos agentes terapéuticos y odianas para el tratamiento de trastornos tromboembólicos como infarto agudo de miocardio y accidentes cerebrovasculares. Su programa de investigación actualmente está financiado por grants de investigación del NIH y del Instituto Nacional de Corazón, los Pulmones y la Sangre, NHLBI por parte, eh, por parte de NIH, y también un um, otro gran del National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences y también recibió una subvención de la American Health Association. Okay, thank you, Fabi. Uh, so you can begin when you want. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Veronica Piz, and thank you, Dr. Dean Gonzalez for the invitation. Also wanna thank Carolina for working with me on scheduling this. Um, really excited to be able to share some of our work related to these novel tobacco products and exposures uh, in the area of cardiovascular disease. And by the way, some of this uh, earlier work was actually done by Veronica, Dr. Pez, I don't know if she remembers that or not. I think she will. She was actually a co-author on one of these papers, so. I do um, remember. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I'll give a brief introduction so that, you know, set up the stage so that hopefully you can be, you can be able to follow up easily on this topic. So as all of you know, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer, not only the United States, but actually worldwide. More than seven, 600 million, you know, of course, you know, I'm in the United States, so we focus on that, uh, suffer from a disease caused by smoking. And that's the same, whether in Ecuador or in any other country, Jordan, where I am from originally. And in terms of, you know, economic burden, it has a major impact on the economy. What is interesting about this, if you think about it, if you look at this, at the risk factors for it, smoking is on the top. It's actually the single most preventable risk factor for development of cardiovascular disease. Um, so, you know, while there are um, the number of smokers, at least in the United States, have gone down, the morbidity and mortality due to that smoking has not gone down, unfortunately. And we think it's because of the fact that there are different types of exposures that people did not account for. But also, more importantly, there are new devices. I'm not going to talk about e-cigarettes, but I'll talk about water pots or hookahs. These devices and e-hookahs, they've gained a lot of popularity. Um, my wife and my collaborator, whom, you know, Veronica knows, she's working on electronic cigarettes, by the way. So if you're interested in learning more about these cigarettes and their impact, you know, you can certainly invite her. Um, so uh, the, the recently, and uh, really around the time that uh, Dr. Piaz joined the lab, we came to know about this notion of third-hand exposure, third-hand smoke. So first-hand is the person with smoking secondhand, you are in a room where smoking is happening, but thirdhand is very different. Thirdhand, you go to a place where smoking has happened. 
So the term was coined in actually the state of California to describe the residual, residual tobacco smoke contamination that remains after cigarette is extinguished. So really it's the toxicants produced by secondhand that end up depositing on services such as curtains, upholstery, car seats, carpet. So really third hand smoke is not strictly it's smoke, it's whatever that's left over. And these toxicants, by the way, as you can see this couch could be a cigarette. If there is a lot of smoking that happened and now a child comes in and sits on it or, or a guest, yeah, they were not present during the smoking but the smoke did not go away. And also the same goes here on the panel, the cartoon on the right. This child was not allowed to come in to this room until smoking has, has, has been done, but all that smoke is on curtains, it's on their crib, it's on the carpet. And that child is slowly being exposed to it over time by making contact with that material. If even if a father smokes outside the home, it's on, their, on his or her shirt, I mean, uh, the, the father or the mother, and they're hugging the child, they're exposing it to third hand smoke. After a while, all these toxicants that are left in the house or the office or a rental car, they become more toxic and they undergo chemical reactions and changes and we call that aging. They undergo an aging process that makes them actually more toxic. So people are skeptic about the seriousness of th third hand smoke, by the way, um, to non-smokers, much like second hand smoke three decades ago. I remember hanging out with a lot of friends when I was in Jordan playing cards while in pharmacy school. And I would say, you know, okay, I'm not the one who's smoking. I'm sitting next to 12 other smokers. I kid you not, true story. Um, it's okay and it's not gonna harm me. But, you know, I'm sometimes I have to deal with cough and other things just because of that. So, you know, but, you know, until recently people were skeptic. Yeah, there's not such a thing. Third hand smoke is not as toxic, but it's actually not. So while parents avoid smoking the presence of their children, they don't know they actually exposing them to more danger, third hand smoke. And we have evidence that actually it's a little bit more toxic than even second hand smoke. And now there's a lot of interest, again, started off in California. Um, there is a lot of data now showing that third hand smoke actually stays for months, actually in rooms where smoking has happened, in the air and the dust and all these surfaces that I showed. Um, in terms of data, we found that actually um, what is interesting is that third-hand smoke contains a lot of compounds that do not exist in second-hand smoke. And if you think about it, exposure to third-hand smoke is much longer. It's slow it's and it's longer because remember, second-hand smoke when you're in the presence of a smoker. But if you're living in a room or a house, you're driving a rental car where, where smoking has happened, you're you know, you're potentially being exposed to much longer period. And so a lot of these compounds are actually carcinogenic. In fact, as I said earlier, a Surgeon General report here in the United States said, while well, there's a decline in people of smoking, mortality and adverse effects did not go down. And we think it's because of people did not factor in this third hand smoke. People actually didn't know that it existed or even it's a threat for human life. Um, so it stays in the apartments, automobiles, businesses, casinos, hotels, motel rooms, all of that. People are exposed to it slowly. So in terms of how people are exposed, as you can imagine, it's dermal rot, skin, dust, inhalation, ingestion. People may be eating things that they find around, or especially babies. There's also evidence that exposure has the capacity to produce high toxic and blood levels. I mean, people were able to detect markers of nicotine and tobacco in the blood of children, even though these children were never exposed to smoke. Um, and until today or until recently, a lot of people actually still disbelieve that third-hand smoke is harmful. But look, all these toes could be a source of smoke. Everything in that in the room, as you can see here. So based on what I just presented to you, there is a lot of interest now in understanding the toxic effect of third-hand smoke and whether it's detrimental to humans. Um, so, you know, in terms of cardiovascular health in particular, there are very limited studies. Um, actually, they were not existent until we got into, into the field, especially in the area of these platelets, which I'll talk about. As you may know, thrombosis is one of the main mechanisms of smoking-related disease. So a lot of cardiovascular deaths are due to this clots forming in our blood vessels. And platelets are key players in thrombosis. So, Really, if you wanna understand the impact of third-hand smoke on cardiovascular disease, we need to look at its impact on platelets. 
So the research question is, we asked is, does third hand smoke increase the risk of thrombotic diseases? And does it modulate platelet function? So let me give you a little bit of ba background of platelets who are not familiar with those. Um, you know, they're also called throm thrombocytes. So from the Greek uh, word thrombo, clot, and cytes is actually a cell. Um, and so they, they can be shown here. They're much smaller than a red blood cell and, and, a, and actually a white blood cell. Um, this is a uh, electron tomography image of platelets. They're actually disc shaped. They don't have a nucleus. They're small in size and they derive from these megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. Unfortunately, they only live for seven to 10 days, depending on the species. Humans are different from mice. Um, they're critically involved in hemostasis. So if you cut yourself while chopping tomatoes or cucumbers, the reason bleeding stops is because the clots become, the platelets become activated, they form a clot and that bleeding stops. But they're also important in thrombosis. And thrombosis is actually the formation of um, a, a clot or a plug. So this is again, to give you an overview of how the platelet plug formation forms. So as you can see here, in the, you know, and, uh, when upon injury, there is a release of some vasoconstricting factors to the side of injury because you want to limit blood loss. So one way to limit blood loss is you limit blood flow to the region where there's injury. Then platelets all of a sudden see things that they normally do not see, including collagen and valvular factors. So platelets adhere, adhesion release so their activation. They secrete a lot of contents from their granules. They actually have a lot of dense granules after granules and they secrete a lot of things that contribute to the clot formation process. The, the, the aggregate, as you can see here, they're coming together, they're for, trying to form a plug, and that's shown here. Initially, this is a plug, but it's not you know, solid. You get fibrin mesh formation as well because of contribution from the clotting cascade, but this clot is not solid enough. It can come off unless it undergoes a clot solidification process, which we call clot, clot attraction, and that depends on a, one of the critical platelet agonists. And that's the plate agonist shown here, Fomin. So this is a platelet and this shows the receptors that are critical for its activation. And those are relevant to the smoke phenotype I'm gonna show you in a little bit. So um, as you can see, platelets can be activated by a host of G protein coupled receptors. One of them is thromboxane A2 receptor, which is activated by thromboxane A2, which is a lipid that comes from the membrane of the, of the platelets. We also have ADP that actually comes from granules within stored within the platelets. It actually binds to P2I1 and P2I12. And then thrombin that binds to protease active receptors. Thrombin is a protease, actually a clotting factor. Can you still see? Sorry, I don't know what happened um, here. So thrombin is a clotting. Um, a uh, factor that also binds to two G protein coupled receptors on the surface uh, of platelets. So all of these together, they trigger signaling, changes in platelets and lead to their activation. How does that happen? There's this integrin of glycoprotein on the surface. Initially it's inactive, it's in a closed conformation, but however, because of signaling by ADP or thrombin or thromboxin A2, it leads to this glycoprotein integrin 2B3A opening up and allowing to fibrinogen to bind. So fibrinogen cross-links platelets together and allows them for them to be aggregated. And that fibrinogen becomes cleaved into fibrin through a thrombin dependent process that I won't, I won't go through. So thrombosis, I said it's a pathological process in which occlusive thrombi form. If it happens in the heart, we call it a heart attack. If it happens in the brain, we call it a stroke. So our hypothesis is that exposure to third-hand smoke impacts platelets and increases the risk of heart attacks or thrombosis. We also hypothesize that this prothrombotic phenotype happens in the offspring when the exposure takes place in utero during or during pregnancy. You know, unfortunately, a lot of the you know labor here that work in cleaning hotels, it might be pregnant woman. So you ask a pregnant woman to go clean a smoking room and say, "Look, you're not being exposed to smoke because this, the the person who's sitting in that hotel room is not there, or they ask them to clean a rental car. The problem is they're being exposed to the smoke, and we think that what prosing is even when the exposure happens to a pregnant woman and she gives birth, years later, that child or that adult at the time will have an increased risk of heart attacks. And we, and we have a model to study that as I will show you. 
So this is a schematic of the hypothesis, third hand smoke. We use a mouse model, modulates hemostasis, increases risk of thrombosis, and it does that by hyperactive platelets. And ultimately it leads to heart attack or stroke depending on where that clot forms. And the same goes if you expose a pregnant mouse, you take the pups years later, they will still experience these impacts on their hemostasis response and thrombosis and hyperactive platelets. So this is this, the aim of the study, to study the impact of third-hand smoke on platelets. And we also wanna do that in the in utero setting. So I'm gonna first start off with the adult mice. And this is our first paper that we published a while ago. And I'm sure you recognize this name. Um, you know, Veronica might remember, we, we were used to go to University of California Riverside to get some samples and do some experiments there. Sometimes collect blood and bring it back to us in university. But it was really, this is the first report ever about the impact of third-hand smoke on hemostasis and thrombogenesis. And I'll show you some of the data. But first, let me show you the protocol. So this is a smoking machine. We used to put material in there. You put curtain, fall street carpet. So you didn't expose the mice. You expose that material in the cages. And then you take this, this material. We did 40 cigarettes. We did 30 in six months. And this is what we exposed, 10 gram of curtain and all these things I'm showing you here. And then we take that material, expose it for a week, then we'll move it to cages. And we let the mice live within that cage. At the same time, we're exposing another set of material for this another week. And then we take the material that was where the mice were living, we bring it back to the exposure chamber and expose it for a second week. And then the other set of material, remember we have two sets of material, we move it and put the mice to live in it. Now the other set of material that, that we, we re-expose it and take it back and we keep switching. So we, we expose the first set, put it in the cage, expose the second set, then we swap and expose, then we swap again. And we repeat that cycle for four to six weeks. So this is the data I'm gonna show you now. Of course, we need to validate the model. Is it real life? Does it mimic real life third-hand smoke exposure? And that's shown here. The total particulate matter in the exposure machine mimics that you see by the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States, at least. And also the, this chemical, this toxicant level, 35 picograms, which is in the average you see in humans living is 44. And then the mice were hyperactive, just like children living in the house of smokers. So really the model mimics real life exposure because that's an important we need for translation of the findings. So we did the golden standard experiment is aggregation. So we measure plated aggregation. How do we measure that? What we do is we put, we get collect blood or you get blood from mice or humans. We put in a glass cuvette and you shoot a beam of light. Initially, there is no light transmission, right? Because it's turbid, light is not gonna go through. However, when you add an agonist or something that activates platelets, let's say it's start coming together to form a clot. So there's more and more space created between these platelets, meaning more and more light is going through. So really we're measuring light transmittance over time, but we're just calling it platelet aggregation. If a platelet aggregation is enhanced, it's indicative of increased risk to heart attack and, and, uh, throm and thrombus formation. We work with platelet-rich plasma. We just get blood, we spin it, and we use the supernatant in the top for our experiments. So this is the first set of data. I know I kept you waiting for a little bit to see the data, but as you can see, this is the ADP agonist. Remember from the introduction that activates the P2Y1 and P2Y12 receptors? Look at this. This is mice are exposed to clean air as control, activated with 2.5 micromore ADP, and these are the third-hand smoke. Look at the difference between the blue and, and the black traces. So there is significant increase in, in aggregation. There is an increase in aggregation indicative of enhanced plated function. The same thing when we treated with five micromotor of the ADP, red with green, again, significantly enhanced. Uh, we also looked at the U46619. Remember the thromboxin A2 agonist? So U46619 is actually a, a mimetic for thromboxin A2. We cannot use thromboxin A2 because um, it has a half-life of 20 seconds. So again, as you can see, there's a big difference. So plated aggregation is enhanced. 
We looked at alpha granule secretion. I didn't show you, I mentioned this before, but I didn't show you the figure. Let's have a lot of granules and they have hundreds of stuff inside these granules. So when plates are activated, some of these granules are secreted out or go to the surface, including P selectin. So here, as you can see, this is a flow cytometry experiment. We use an antibody um, that recognizes the um, P selectin and we do flow and we see how much P selectin is on the surface. This is the resting, this is the clean air simulated, but look in the third hand small, the level of P selectin on the surface is much higher in response to ADP or U46619, which again indicates that platelets are hyperactive. But you know, it's all good, but you know, this is all in vitro in a test tube. But how about a, a live mouse model? And, and Veronica did a lot of these experiments for us. So we use the FERC chloride carotid artery injury model. So we get the carotid artery out and we you know, cut the mouse open, we put a probe and we measure blood flow. And then we trigger thrombosis by ferric chloride. And the time needed for the clot to form is what we measure. So we're measuring the way we measure the occlusion time. And as you can see here, the time needed for a thrombus to form in the third hand smoke exposed mice is much shorter, which indicates a higher risk for thrombosis. And also is consistent with the aggregation. We just saw that platelets are hyperactive. So this makes sense that the time for thrombus formation is shorter because platelets are hyperactive. We also looked at the impact on hemostasis, you know, that normal physiological function. And this is, again, Rocket remembers that the tail bleeding time. We clip the tail about five millimeter, millimeters only. We put it in saline and measure the time for the bleeding to stop. As you can see here, again, the time for bleeding is much shorter, which is consistent with the thrombosis phenotype and consistent with the hyperactive platelet. So really, for the first time, we're showing that third hand smoke exposure modulates platelet function and underscores the negative health consequences of third hand smoke to human health. It's not safe, it's not benign. People need to know. And we're hoping that this will guide and it's actually already guiding policies to make sure that we control exposure to third hand smoke. You know, these housekeepers should not be forced to go on cleaning, you know, rooms and hotels where smoking is allowed. So now I'm gonna switch gears and show you the in utero exposure. Again, um, there were some studies that early exposure to nails affects body mass and development of the immune system. What we asked the question, does prenatal exposure in utero exert negative health effects in the context of cardiovascular system? So this is the model we used. Again, same exposure, but in this case, what we did, we exposed the mice that are pregnant, but we began a week before, because remember, I mean, a woman doesn't just start being exposed to tobacco because she, as soon as she gets pregnant, no, people are doing it. So this is a model we began but one week before. We put the female mice in the cage that, were, that has the material that was exposed. And then we expose them one week, and then we start mating them with a male. And we continue the exposure throughout the pregnancy. As soon as the mice give birth, we actually stop the exposure and we do the experiment. So remember, and these mice, by the way, the data I'm showing you, this is, this is from mice that were, that were 10 weeks old, meaning, and remember, these mice were never exposed after they were born. All the exposure happened in utero, pure in utero during pregnancy. But look at this, the thrombosis, occlusion time is much shorter. We were shocked to see this phenotype. We thought we need to do some exposures after the mice are born, and we didn't. Because remember, the earlier exposures were for actually six months because it's, it's a slow process. But that tells you how vulnerable these fetuses are in the womb of the, of the mom. Also, bleeding time is much shorter. We look at the platelet count. Interestingly, we didn't see any difference in the platelet count between, between the neuro uh, clean air and the neuro third hand smoke. Uh, we also looked at cloud retraction. Some of you might remember this, some of this data, by the way, is not um, is unpublished. They really, it's still fresh because we're still working on it. So remember the clot retraction, how I said platelets need to, the clot needs to retract to become solid so that it doesn't come off because of the sheer stress of the blood flowing through our vessels. So as you can see, this is the resting 
uh, free, fresh air, and this is the simulated. So you compare this one with this one. Notice how initially there's no retraction here, whereas you can see the third hand smoke, it began to retract. Now this one is started to retract, but look, there's already much more retraction. Same here. So if you follow up all the way, you can see that even up until 45 minutes, the clot, this is a clot. In the third hand smoke stimulated, it retracts much more than the, than the clean air, which again is supportive of a hyperactive platelet chemical. In terms of aggregation, let's are hyperactive folks. They're much more aggregation, whether ADP or thrombin we use as an agonist. This was published earlier this year, by the way. Um, we also looked, what I didn't mention is there's PGI2, prosocyclin. So endothelial cells secrete prosocyclin. The reason normally now, as we're sitting, our platelets do not adhere to the site of injury or to the blood vessel because endothelial cells secrete PGI2. PGI2 binds to a, a GPCR on the platelet surface and it raises cyclic EMP which actually inhibits platelets. So if you, let, you elevate cyclic EMP levels, platelets are inhibited, and that's why platelets cannot adhere to the blood vessel. But we thought, is PGI2 impacted? And this inhibitory signaling that's very critical so that our platelets do not become hyperactive. Is it impacted by third enhancement? So PGI2, as I said, made by theo cells, very cyclic EMP, and it's a platelet inhibitor. Notice here, look at the percentage of inhibition of aggregation. PGI2 is very effective in inhibiting aggregation in the clean air exposed mice. But look at this. It does not effectively inhibit platelet aggregation in the third-hand smoke exposed mice. Again, this work is not published. So really, the third-hand smoke makes platelet, platelets resistant to inhibition by PGI2 which is another mechanism for the inhibitory. Again, dense granule secretion is also enhanced. I already showed you this data, the piece of lectin on the surface. Uh, sorry, this is dense granules. This is ATP secretion. So there are alpha granules and there are dense granules. Alpha granules, this is just, we measure ATP secretion from granules. You can see a lot of more in the third-hand smoke. Um, again, alpha granules, like I showed you with the, with the adult exposure, Again, you can still see there is a lot more in the third hand smoke. So plates are hyperactive. These mice were exposed only during their, while the mom is pregnant. They have high risk of, of thrombosis. Even the integrin 2B3A2 activation that I showed you, that integrin that changes conformation that allows fibrinogen to bind and cross link platelets together. It's also, compare this with this. And third hand clean air with third hand smoke thrombin. Plates are hyperactive. We also looked at another marker platelets, which is really phosphatidylserine. So I won't go through this in a lot of details, but for the clotting cascade to work together with platelets, some of the clotting factors have to disassemble on the surface of the platelet. And that lipid surface is actually phosphatidylserine. But so when platelets are activated, they put more phosphatidylserine on their surface. And we can measure that as a measure of platelet activation using flow cytometry. As you can see, fossil serine exposure is much higher in the third hand smoke compared to the clean air. And that's again with ADP and with thrombin. So this also suggests that the clotting cascade may be hyper activated, something that we're looking at in the future. Um, you might wonder about some signaling, some signaling molecules or proteins. So we looked at first, AKT and ERK, those are critical proteins in platelet activation. This is third hand smoke and this is clean air. As you can see, there's more phosphorylation, which means more activation of, of ERK in the third hand smoke compl compared to the clean air. And the same was observed with AKT. There's more phosphorylation. And this is the quantification of the data. So this provides biochemical evidence that platelets are hyperactive. We also looked at this small GTPase. As you can see, this is again unpublished data. New, you can see there's more phosphorylation of RAP1. And RAP1, by the way, is very critical for clot retraction. So again, it looks like platelets have this widespread hyperactive phenotype. Um, then we next wanted to look at you know, some of the markers of nicotine. So cotinin is a toxicant that is a metabolite of 
of nicotine. We were trying to understand which of the toxicants are responsible for looking for the impact of um, third hand smoke. So what we did in this case, we injected cochinin into mice for one week. We collected blood and we added thrombin as an agonist. As you can see, the cochinin injected mice, their plates are hyperactive in terms of aggregation and alpha grant and dense granules secretion. We also did an experiment where we looked at cochinin and the thrombosis model. Notice cotinin, this is very preliminary. We only did it with four mice, but look, yes. aggregation um, is. Sorry. Uh, yes, sorry. Marley. We are not looking at your um, slides. Uh, we are looking at sex dependent differences in utero, HS, but not the one that you are talking about, uh, uh, cotinin. Oh, really? Yes, uh, at least I don't see it. <laughs> yeah, let me, sorry, let me, let me stop yeah. sharing and share it again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Can you see it now? Now, yeah. Cretinin. Yes. So. Yeah, perfect. Now yeah, you can. Sorry about that. Yes. Yeah. I don't know what it's happened. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah. So as you can see, this is cretinin. Um, and the we that was injected. You can see that cretinin injected mice. Their platelets are hyperactive, in terms of aggregation and secretion, and also, the mice themselves are under high risk of thrombosis. The occlusion time is much shorter, in cretinin injected mice. So this tells us that cotinin, one of the toxicant of third hand smoke, is actually very toxic and is the one that probably contributes to the phenotype we're observing. So, you know, we also looked at gender dependent differences. I mean, you know, there, there's, there's always interest in that. And I'll show you some of the data in the in utero. As you can see, this is male and this is female. As you can see in this case, the males um, you know, this is the, the uh, quantification of, of the data. As you can see, the males appear to be a little bit more um, ATP secretion compared to the females. Um, and again, the same goes for dense and alpha granule secretion. They're higher in the male than actually in the female, which was really interesting to us. Uh, we've also looked at some other markers, but I won't be able to talk about them for the interest of time. So our data, this part of the talk, shows that third hand smoke exposure, including in utero, increases the risk of thrombosis and enhances platelet function, thereby producing a prothrombotic state. So I'm gonna, and this is, the data really provides ample evidence that third hand smoke is a serious threat to human health. We need to educate the public, and hopefully now that you know about it, you can also help us in educating the public. And also, it really may provide foundation for putting some policies and guidelines to limit exposure. I want to switch gears now and talk about hookah water pipe. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. It's very popular in the Middle East. Um, so it's, it's very prevalent, as you can see, maybe not as, as the other types of tobacco, but it keeps increasing. Look, high school students, middle school students are taking it. So the, you guys recognize this famous singer, Canadian singer is also helping, unfortunately, spread this, making it very popular. So we also devise a model because nobody knows or, or the direct impact of hookahs on cardiovascular health is not known. So we wanted to study that. So we use the whole body exposure model. Actually, this is the hookah. You connect it to this machine and pump automated. And the smoke is routed to this exposure chamber. We're continuously monitoring carbon monoxide. This is the actual picture here in the top. This is the hookah exposure chamber. This is the pump. You program it and you tell it how many puffs you want to do. Because there's studies about how many puffs people take, how many times they inhale it, how long is each puff, and how much is the space between the puffs. So we use what they call the Beirut method from Lebanon, Beirut, Middle East. It was very popular, kind of gold standard in the world. And this is what we did in this case. So we exposed the mice to water pipe hookah, and then looked at the impact of it on platelet function. So first we confirmed that these mice are being exposed to tobacco. So we measured the cotinin, the nicotine metabolite cotinin. As you can see, uh, uh, water pipe smoke is what WS stands for. As you can see, we see cotinin in the exposed mice, but not the clean air. As you can see, platelets are hyperactive in terms of aggregation, response to thrombin. Also, their integrin activation is higher. 
ERK and AKT again are also high uh, activated to a much, much larger extent. Um, we also, did, I showed you some of this data too, Katenin, we did it here as well. Notice here, folks, we looked at fibrinogen levels. Remember fibrinogen, it's the cross-linked platelets. We didn't see any effect, but we did see that there is more platelet spreading. You know, when platelets are activated, they spread. They want to cover as much area as they can so that they can prevent bleeding. There's more platelet spreading compared to um, in the uh, HOCA exposed compared to the control. And the same goes for glycoprotein 2D3A. In terms of in vivo, again, occlusion time is really short, folks. And so is the bleeding time. So this is the first evidence that water pipe smoke is really increases platelet activation and increases the risk of thrombosis. Um, we also did, you know, we tried to mix and match. So I talk about third hand smoke, if you're curious, we also did third hand hookah. So in this case, we exposed material, as you can see here, same protocol. And then we put that material in cages to let the mice live. And we evaluated that, their effect. So look at these mice, third hand hookah, just like third hand smoke, very toxic. This is unpublished work. Um, and again, we confirmed that the mice are exposed to hookah. This is catenin in their blood. And again, look at aggregation. This is in response to collagen and their agonist. Aggregation is much higher, and so is ATP secretion. I'm sure, Veronica rem remembers these traces. She generated a lot of them. So, you know, we've also made comparisons, if you're curious, between third hand hookah and third hand. Um, in utero third hand hookah and utero third hand smoke, you know, because again, we want to study as many, as many experimental conditions as we can. Um, so in this case, again, we're doing in utero third hand hookah. In this case, we were looking at pregnant mice exposed to the material that was exposed to hookah smoke. And we're comparing that with mice, pregnant mice, uh, I mean, the offspring of pregnant mice that are exposed to cigarette smoking. Um, and we looked at once the mice became 10 weeks old in third hand smoke and in hookah, we compared them. Look at this time to occlusion. Actually the hookah, both of them are much shorter than the clean air. But interestingly, hookah did not reduce this to the same level as third hand smoke. So it is possible that really third hand smoke is more toxic than third-hand hookah for these pregnant uh, females, however, or for the offspring of pregnant females. However, you have to keep in mind that we, in this case, we use 40 cigarettes. Um, in this case, we use this protocol, um, which is, again, it's very, very common and very popular. In terms of aggregation and ATP secretion, as you can see, this is the clean air, the blue trace, the black trace is in utero third hand hookah. And this purple or red, if you will, is in utero um, third hand smoke. As you can see, both are much higher. The irrigation of platelets is much higher than the control. But what is, was interesting is the irrigation in the third hand smoke was much higher than the hookah, which is consistent with this data. There's more, there's shorter occlusion time in the third hand smoke than the third hand. And again, when it comes to ATP secretion, you see the same thing. Clean air, this is hookah, and this third hand smoke. There's much more than in the um, uh, third hand smoke compared to the third hand hookah. So, you know, I wanted to leave some time for. Um, questions and be able to answer it. But I want to acknowledge the people who are really contributed to this work. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Veronica Espinoza was one of the first um, individuals to really help us create that, that project. And I, again, I mentioned earlier, we made all these trips to UC Riverside. We're doing some experiments there. So I want to acknowledge her and as, all, as well as also now as a collaborator and also, I'm sure she remembers Dr. Manuela Martins Green. I, I made those in bold and underlined because Manuela Martins Green 
is the one who actually introduced us to the topic of third hand smoke. And I don't know if Mark remembers, you know, I, I met Mark, Dr. Martins Green at a conference in, the, in Sacramento, California that I didn't want to travel to. But the funding agency said, hey, we gave you money. It wasn't for smoking, you have to attend. And I'm glad that I was forced to attend it because we probably would have never met in Sacramento and we began this collaboration as well. And I also like to thank uh, Dr. Hamdi Ali. He's contributed to the Neutero work, Dr. Danielle, um, and then Anna, she's a research assistant in the lab. And also, of course, Zubair, Veronica. I don't know if Veronica overlaps, overlapped with him, I don't remember. Letty also did some yeah. exposures for us, yes. And then um, also want to acknowledge my collaborator and wife, Dr. Padma Shkul. She was no, part of these yeah. studies. <laughs> and now her postdoc who did a lot of the work, Ahmed Al Arabi is a postdoc in her lab right now, but he was a PhD student who actually did a lot of work. And now Carlos is also an RA with, with Dr. Shkul. And of course the funding agencies, You know, without the funding from the NIH, we were very fortunate. Veronica, earlier we were struggling to get funding, but we're fortunate the last three years we got an R01 and R21. We were able to get more than $2 million in, in funding to support our research. Yes. Um, as you can see, you know, it takes a team, it takes a village to make something happen. And you know, I really appreciate the contributions of everybody that we did. Really, the take-home message is non-smoking folks is the best policy. People should quit smoking and we should really encourage people not to, to smoke. So let's work together to be smoke free, whatever you are, you can contribute, can educate people and let them know, you know, I've had my aunt die because of smoking and her husband also was a smoker. They both died at a very young age and they would say, you know, I'm not exposing my children. I'm done smoking in front of them and they can come to the bedroom until we're done. No, some of my cousins now are dealing with some health issues at a young age because of third hand smoke. A lot of us may be dealing with some health issues. We don't know. We oh, we say it's her hereditary. It's because of genetics. Not necessarily. It could be because of that exposure that we had to deal with, and not knowing it's a real threat to human health. And we just say, "Wow, well, it's it's genetics." It could be, but I think it could be more. I also want to acknowledge Victor Rodriguez, who is doing. He did a lot of exposures. Zaya as well, at UTL Paso, Letty and Midhat oversaw some of that, these things as well on third has more, I don't wanna forget. I also wanna thank all the other collaborators. Um, and thank you, I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Fadi. Your uh, conference is very interesting. And uh, you have done a lot of things since I left. Um, I hope thank that you. we can uh, collaborate more. Um, yes. I have Hope a so. question. Yeah, really. Um, I have a question. Uh, do you have some idea why is the difference between male and female uh, about the, the That's a really good question, um, Veronica. We do not know yet. And that's something we're interested in looking at. You know, you know, we're gonna try to do some profiomic analysis of the platelets, um, but also look at some of these gonadal hormones yes. and see whether, you know, you know, like say if you remove, um, you know, uh, you know, if you do hysterectomy, you remove the uterus from female mice, what happens to the risk? Because a lot of these risks published, you know, from published work from, from other areas, they attribute that to the gonadal hormones. So that's something we're actually very interested uh, in um, in fact, even, you know, I don't know whether I want to mention that in public, but even transgender, you know, I was talking to Fatima that, hey, can we do some transgender studies in a mouse models? They, people do that. I mean, you do a hysterectomy, you remove the gonads, and then you start injecting a male mouse with the female hormones and vice versa, and look at the risk. But that's a really good question that we're going to be investigating in the future. Uh, because yeah. the gender differences I noticed, we just we actually just published that earlier this year. Yes. Um, how many months are the, the mice that you are working with uh, with these experiments about sex or gender in thrombosis? Uh, so when we do these experiments, we use um, 
it, we, it varies, honestly, the moms. We sometimes, I think we've done, the maximum we've done, we expose 10 females together because, you know, when they give birth, each female uh, mouse can give up to seven or eight liters or even 10 yes. pups. But for some reason, we expose them to smoke, the litter size goes down, which is another area that we're trying to find a collaborator who would work with us. Why is the litter size actually smaller? It's because of hypoxia. Um, but we usually work with 10 females at a time so we can get enough number of mice so we can do experiments in cohorts to avoid variability. So we yeah. try to do our experiments in cohorts. So we get a lot of mice and the lab is super busy for the neuro experiments. Yes, I know. So yes, it will be very interesting to work with the hormones, especially estrogens. And then see if, uh, what is the importance of how Absolutely. estrogens can do with this. It's uh, very nice. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to ask something about the work. Don't be shy. <laughs> Um, well, about the aggregation experiments, um, I don't know, uh, do you have any other um, is, uh, molecules that you are working with that uh, are part of the cigarettes composition? And uh, do you have a mind something about the, the mechanism? Yeah, that, um, that's a, another good question, uh, Veronica. We, one of the aims of this, these grants is to actually to look at the toxicants. So, you know, mm -hmm. I showed you this earlier one, the NNL um, molecule. We're planning on injecting that. Oops, where is it? Sorry. I'll show you the. Yeah, this one molecule, and also mm -hmm. others. We're trying to. We're we're in the process of looking at it and also looking at acrolein, which is an aldehyde. So we have a host of potential chemicals that we're gonna be looking at. But at this time, at this stage, um, you know, we're only still in the third year of funding. So we have two more years to go. And that's yeah. when this looking at the toxicants is gonna to kick in. Because yeah, one of our primary goals is to see which toxicants and very high smoke are responsible for this chemical. Have you done any experiments about a dose response? So um, how do you know the dose that you are doing the in vitro experiments? Yes. Yeah, so with the with the dose response with the toxicants, what we do is we look like a tenon dose. We use one micromolar, which yeah. I, I showed you here. And we use one micromolar based on the literature. So people have already published studies about how much cotinin, you know, a typical person exposed to enhanced smoke has. Yes. So we rely on the literature actually, because you're right. I mean, we cannot use just a random dose. And so, I mean, is this even real toxic dose? Yes. Before translation of our data to humans, yes. you know, we use doses, we carefully select the doses of cotinin to make sure that, you know, whatever dose we use is relevant in third-hand smoke exposure. Very, very good questions, Veronica. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, when you're talking about um, toxic health, of course, you are talking about intoxication here. So uh, is there, has it told me, is there a way that you can say, for example, it's uh, the, if I have like 10 cigarettes a day, uh, I'd, I'd be more, um, I don't know the word, I, I forgot the word. It's more possible that I have this uh, thrombosis um, risk than if I um, yes. smoke only two percent. Uh, yes, actually, yes. That is, people have done that studies, and it is somewhat dose dependent. But keep in mind, unfortunately, the actually, maybe fortunately or for, un unfortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, it's not a linear dose response. So people need to keep in mind. Say, yeah, if I cut my smoke you know, by to only maybe five or 10 cigarettes, I should be okay, no. B yeah. Because it's not a linear dose response. 
So wow. it's not linear. And also the cardiovascular system is so sensitive. A little bit of smoke can mess it up and cause disease. That's important when you talk about hookah, everything. You cannot yes. say, yeah, I only smoke a few cigarettes a day. No, no, no. Over time, mm -hmm. you're going to start experiencing it. Toxicity doesn't go away. It is very, very toxic. And again, because it's not linear. You know, if you cut your number of cigarettes by half, your risk doesn't go by 50%. It may go down only by 10% smoking because it's not a linear, a linear do dose response. So that, that's a very good question again. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there is some genetic um, influence in this response? Uh, Actually, yes. Especially for the in utero, Veronica. My God, it's like, you know, you never left the lab. The in utero work, folks, we are actually planning on, uh, we, we're running, we're waiting for the genetic epigenetics data to come back. We've actually collected the platelets. We send them to, to look at the, um, you know, for, for RNA-seq data analysis to look at what changes has happened. Uh, we're waiting for the university to, uh, the core facility to provide us with that data. Uh, so if you buy me again a year or so, you know, I'm, I'll probably have a little bit more data. Or maybe you and I, when you and I meet about our collaboration, we can discuss that as well. I, but, I yeah. like it very much. I like yeah. to study this and to see, yeah. to look, like you say, epigenetics, yeah. especially methylation or something like this. Yeah, I, I, yes. I really like to do this. We, we haven't study. done any DNA methylation yet. We're actually, what we did is just the RNA-seq data right yes. now. Because you know these cost like to be honest to run some samples, for sample costs us six thousand dollars. Even course. though we have we have you know even though we have funding, because, but it's like yes. yeah no, we gotta we want to do it gradually. So but yeah yes. the DNA methylation. Um, yes, it will be really right. yeah. Yes, of course. And so uh, you have a lot of things to talk about, to to study in here. Yeah, <laughs> because it's a very nice fun, uh, a very nice study and. Uh, it's a really actual because everyone is, uh, or, or hookah, <laughs> or it's uh, yeah, smoking cigarettes. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, really, really nice study, Adi. So, thank you. Thank you very much for your conference again. Um, and, uh, well, I will be more than happy to, to talk to you to yeah. our collaboration. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm really excited about your ideas that you shared with me and I, to try and work with you on it. Um, I'm very, very excited. And maybe one of those days I can visit you in, you know, in Ecuador, if there's an I opportunity. Hope so. um, but again, I want to thank you for the opportunity again. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Carolina, for assisting. And then thank you, Dr. Espinoza, for all. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Adi. So All right. we'll be in touch. Until we bye meet bye. again. <laughs> bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye. <laughs>